Hi everyone and welcome back to the second session of today's Spring Festival. Uh, next up we have Lara um, who will be speaking about the beauty in purposeful design. She is Head of Marketing Operations and Strategy at Blue Air which is part of Unilever. Um, just so you know we will have a little bit of time at the end for some Q&As so just pop them in a little Q&A box at the bottom of the screen um, and we'll try and get through to you. Hi Lara, how are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you? Yeah, good, thanks. So lovely to see you. Uh, really looking forward to today's talk. Same so here. What, I, <laughs> what I will do is hand over to you if you want to just give a little bit of an update on yourself and then go ahead and share your screen. Sounds good. So firstly, thank you so much for having me. My name is Lara Kirbaj. As you've probably seen in the intro card, I am from Lebanon, has, have been working in the FMCG world for the past 10 years. Um, I've worked in beauty and um, personal care products from brands like Dove and Axe um, for in, in marketing and product innovation. And now I recently moved into, into a role in, um, in Blue Air, which is a company that develops purifiers to basically provide freedom to breathe for everybody around the world. I'm very excited for this session because it's a subject that's very close to my mind to my heart and um i can't see you but i hope and guess that you can see me i will start sharing my screen um i will definitely leave some time at the end for questions uh, it's hopefully a very simple take on on my thoughts on design and beauty and how they come together um but i'm very excited for us to run through some of the examples that i've come across and leave some time at the end um for all of us to to chat through so with that, okay, so unless told otherwise, I believe you can all see my screen. Looks so, great. <laughs> perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the session for this afternoon, I guess in the UK, is on the beauty in purposeful design. So it's a very simple chat with me, Adam. Um, it's basically how do we bring the elements of, of the beauty into designing with purpose without compromising anything that links into design. When I was thinking of, of this subject and I went ahead, when I had shared this initially with Jennifer and the team, it, I I knew that it was something that I was very passionate about on how you sort of drive consumer insight all the way into, into design, but how in between you link it into purpose and you make sure it, it's something beautiful. Because I believe that everything can be beautiful and I know that sounds a bit cliche, but actually when you work in fast moving consumer good products or any type of product really, you, did, you, you realize that there needs to be a beautiful element for it to come to exist or otherwise it's just another thing that's in the market. So when I was thinking of what is design basically, at first I was like, oh yeah, it's, um, it's I don't know, it's art, it's, uh, it's a body wash bottle, it's uh, you design a building. Then I realized that actually design is in everything. And some of the simplest things that you think about in design are very complex. Some of us, I guess, are lucky to, to work on, on products and brands that are extremely fun and, and cool to design. While I guess in other cases, some things like some commodities and some, some things are much more practical and things you don't think of, like the person who designs napkins, for example, or the person who designs ketchup bottles. I mean... You don't think about it enough, but like if a ketchup bottle is designed wrong, it's a struggle. I mean, I guess we all still struggle with that to a certain extent. So clearly some more for, um, room for design there. But um, then you have like cool things to design, like sneakers and stuff. But then you, again, you have like logos, you have underwear, tires, buildings, a pizza slice. So it's literally, and I know this is going to sound cliche, but design actually is all around us. And I, I say this because I think every person and everything they do on a day-to-day -day basis, it could link to creating a design that could change 
something or someone's life. And I think when you work in a job or you you work on something that actually generates design, you really have a bigger role to do than just designing a product or a campaign. And you're really sort of basically playing a role in people's lives because at the end of the day, it's all driven from a consumer insight and a need. And for that to come to life, it needs a design. So we'll walk through some of the examples in a bit and and you get to understand a bit where my passion comes from and some of the examples of how they really build on, on the purpose of design and its beauty. So how do we define beauty? I mean, it's very simple. I think everybody sees beauty, everybody loves beauty, you use beauty to, dis to, to, to describe people, places, um, products, uh, movies. Beauty is basically everywhere. And it's, it's a combination of qualities that, according to the Oxford Dictionary, such as shape, color, or form, that pleases the aesthetic senses, especially the sight. Right? So it's a very simple concept, beauty, that is again, all around us, but it's how do we bring it into our day-to-day -day work as well. How do we define purpose on the other side? It's, uh, it's basically, and that's mostly purpose linking into design, right? Um, because obviously purpose is a very broad word that is being used in everything at the moment, but I think it's, it's, um, if we link it specifically to design, it's about being very clear about who you are and what you stand for. And that again, linking to my second slide could be about everything, could be whether you're designing a napkin or whether you're designing sneakers or whether, whether you're designing the next community school. You just need to be clear about who you are and what you stand for and basically what you're so solving for, both as a person and as, as, a, as an organization, of course. And then if, if we sort of bring the other element of, of, of purposeful design, which is the first description was a bit more simple in, in what is um, purpose when it links into design. And here, when you design purposefully, it's basically recognizing exactly the need and as the primary condition for that design. So you link, again, everything to a consumer need, to a consumer insight, and from there, you develop a design that speaks to that consumer. And what I usually do with my teams and, and whenever we start a brief or whatnot, I really try to name that person. And I know it's also an old trick that, that everybody does, but you give that person a name, like what does she need? How old is she? Where does she live? And why is that napkin going to make her life better? I know the napkin example is a very simple and funny one, but why is it going to make her life better versus other, other napkins or other deodorants or other beer bottles? So it's really Im like imagining that person and what your design can help in making their life a better life to a certain extent. I, as I was putting this together as well, I really dug into people who have spoken about design and and um, and purposeful design. And of course, if you're in the industry, you will notice that a lot of talk about purpose has risen much more in the past couple of years versus the past, right? Like, I guess those who were in the industry 20 years ago, if you look at the ads and the campaigns, probably you would you would argue that purpose wasn't at the center of them, but it was basically beauty and utility. And that's why at the time you still had a bit of sexism, racism, not very appropriate ads that went along, but there definitely was beauty and whoever sits and goes through campaigns and, and products from before, a lot of those have lived through ages, right? Like if you think of the Campbell soup um, can, I mean, that's an example that is still shared everywhere and has barely changed over the years because it has a certain sense of beauty and utility that has worked for consumers for the past um, so many years. I think to Paul Rand's um, definition of, of purposeful design and thoughts on design, like 
he says it's ideally beauty and utility are mutually generative. But I think what is missing in this in this definition and what, what you, we see today is purpose. And not in the broad sense, because purpose to what I've mentioned in the past few slides is really, could really be just answering a consumer need. You don't need to be changing the world and, and building trees and and um, talking about all the popular political topics. You just need to be answering a need that makes sense for a consumer. I've In the next few slides, what I've done is I've picked up a few examples of um, untraditional, basically design ideas that have disrupted a bit the industry. Some of them you might have heard of, some of them not at all. Some of them are going to put a smile on your face. Some of them are going to think, oh, that's super lame. Um, but I wanted to, given I spend a lot of time talking about in my past 10 years, deodorants and shower gels and soaps and stuff. We'll get to that in a second, but I want to take a bit of an outside perspective on on alternative innovations and 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 creations that have really disrupted purposeful design. And again, I think a lot of those can be a lot of talk and mean not much when you really launch it. It's probably a good campaign idea or probably a good story to go on a slide. But in reality, how functional are they? Um, there are six examples. Um, I will share them and I will give you my two cents at the end. So the first one is called the Light Phone, and it's a, it's a techie company basically that created a phone from the 90s and, and bring, it's really, obviously they don't define it like this. The way they define it is bringing simplicity, simplicity and mindfulness through technology and design. So it's a very simple phone that looks a bit like a Kindle, doesn't have bright colors, doesn't have colors really. You can only access contacts and and um, an alarm and, and stuff like that. It's not It's not technologically advanced in any sense. So if you, and their whole mission is to, is to bring mindfulness into technology. And if you think about it, this is basically really the Nokia 90s phone. So they basically repurpose how this innovation started to make it purposeful in 2023 and link it to a cause. I will keep my thoughts till the end for really impacting your thoughts. Um, this one is the Mind Journal, and this one also takes a simple uh, insight on how men don't share feelings. And I know a lot of brands and a lot of companies, I've worked on male brands for most of my career, have really used men and their feelings to, to try and change the norm and push men to, to be more expressive. And this one is basically a simple journal that redefines things through design and allows men to talk about their feelings in more alternative ways and cooler ways where they feel spoken to and they feel heard and they feel seen and they don't feel like they're ashamed of doing so. I know I said I won't give my thoughts, but I think this is actually my favorite one. This is an agency that creates um, um, instruction manuals, but they really try to bring delight and well-being into like conventionally dull and frustrating experiences. If you go through that website, it's called Missing Pages. Um, there's like a story in each of in each of them. Some of you might have experienced maybe some of those designs in IKEA while losing your mind and building about your bed, but um, there's like a comic story going throughout it from something that you really think that nobody looks at or nobody sees or nobody pays attention, but it's really bringing those small design elements to something rather boring that I think would have a big impact. This one is also, I think, something that hits home to a lot of people, and I don't know if you've seen it. I have seen it even in Lebanon, which I find crazy that it's made it that far. It's, uh, it's, it's called Before I Die, and it's... Um, basically a community design project where people around basically go and and it's restoring perspective in a community through design. So you go and talk about the things you want to do or the things you want to change in the world before you die. And it creates this sense of belonging and community through design. Again, think about it. You're not selling anything even. You're just selling dreams 
through design, which I find beautiful. While there are tons of um, mindfulness apps, I think why this one stood out to me, it's called Sway. It's um, basically, it's designed to move with your body and your movement. So it like tracks how you're feeling, what you're doing, the time you're up and et cetera, in order to, um, to basically help you on your mindfulness journey. And the last one, which I found extremely funny, which the picture is not showing right now, but basically it's a, it's called a tickle clock and um, it basically redesigns Monday mornings. So it makes you grin instead of groan. It, when, you, when you start it, it's a ticklish and it has a laugh of a child. And I'm not a morning person at all. And I'm currently in the US. So you can imagine I woke up early for this. And I was thinking it would be cool to have this around. Um, I haven't tried it, but I, but I plan to. So I think with, with those six examples, if we skim through them, I think like, I want to say the first two and the, and the mindfulness app, I think those are, I wouldn't say lazy jobs, but I would say easy ideas that basically came through somebody finding an opportunity through, through something that exists already and building on it. I want to say things like the, the user manual where you really basically find something so simple and add a small touch to it and it all of a sudden becomes something you talk about like you think receipts and structure manuals these things that people never look at all of a sudden become become engaging and it's because they're telling a story because they're answering a consumer because if you think about it when you're building furniture you're so frustrated you most definitely fight with your partner and and argue and you have sleepless nights and IKEA's latest campaign answers to that as well. So what if you can add a touch of purpose, a touch of beauty into that? What's the impact that it would have on your brand and actually on, on society? So this summarizes a few examples and I'm happy to answer some questions on them or hear your thoughts on some of them at the end. And, and the idea is building to what I just shared is that design can beautifully bring a different purpose to different people as long as it's centered around the need as long as it's not a haphazard thing that came to exist. And you see a lot of those, those um, failed examples, which I didn't want to focus on today because I wanted this session to be more about celebrating things rather than bashing things. But we all know tons of design examples that, that didn't work and, and didn't make sense, really. So it's, it's always easy to... to put some, some good examples of designs on a slide. And, and I think we, we all do it in our jobs where we sort of sit in a room and, and look at the amazing examples and think, oh, how did they do it? It's so amazing. And they won an award and they won design award here and they won a can award there. And, and it's, it's as simple, but as complex as you make it to. And, and this is an exercise that I, I do usually whenever we launch a product because working in the FMCG world, you sort of work end to end from the designing the product to designing the campaign that links into it. And we live in a world now where again, it's not enough to just say, oh, I need a deodorant. Like you need to wonder around on what is missing and really based on your life, on your friends, on your partner, on your parents, on people who you work with, wander around with curiosity and basically ask what if, what if there was, um, um, I don't know, it's going to sound very lame, but a shower gel that foamed so you can shave while you're in the bathroom. That's probably how the first foaming shower gel came to exist. Like what if you can bring textures and feelings into the shower experience and, um, and change an act as simple as showering to make it a bit more indulging and a bit more um, enjoyable. Another question is, is to ask is what's next? So if you look at like the simple um, industries or, or the simple products, whether it's, I don't know, sneakers or 
or deodorants or beer bottles or um, mugs. Like when you think of what's next, of course, a lot of the answers are, yeah, you can have AI linked into a barcode and you can have recycled plastic bottles from the ocean. And a lot of those have been used as great PR stunts as well. But then you realize that a lot of them don't really lift to see the, the light because a lot of them are like good stunts and then fade away because either the product is not sustainable enough to continue to live or the sustainability and the purpose that it was designed with is not really efficient or profitable for the company. So they do a, a PR stunt and they just sort of move on. And that's why I think when you design with purpose in everyday things, you need to really think of what's the future of it and, and what's next for it. I think also one thing I've learned and I think is very important and I'm experiencing it right now in the new role I took on is you need to become an expert fast. But an expert doesn't mean you need to go study for like 10 years about air purifiers or about deodorants or about ketchup. It's basically, in my humble opinion, you need to expert become an expert in understanding the consumer you're serving and the competition around you. And it's very simple because this is all information you find around. So as long as you become an expert in understanding who you're serving and why you need to create something because everything around you is not enough, I think that's how you become an expert. And it's not about becoming an expert in the technology or in the industry or whatnot. It's those two things, becoming a consumer expert and becoming an expert in understanding what everybody else around you is offering. And one thing that I find very impactful, which in obviously bigger companies like Unilever is easy to do. You need to bring someone on board, which these companies are so big and layered that you could definitely find your boss or your colleague or your teammate or anybody to come on board and build a story and build a, build a, a reason for it to exist. But in simpler, and I find this more in my current role, in, in, in smaller companies or smaller uh, opportunities, you really need to bring somebody on board, whether it's your agency, whether it's, it's a colleague, whether it's a retailer, because really um, it's those details that really bring the design to the next level. Because otherwise everybody's creating a lot of things a lot of times, but it's about those simple, accelerated things that you add to your design that really differentiate you and bring and bring long-term purposefulness into it. And basically, in summary, I think there's three things that stood out to me also while putting this together is you really need to be informed and you really need to be empathetic and you really need to be excited. Anybody who knows me or has spent any time with me in the past 10 years um, and probably that's how I made it to here to be here speaking to you, knows that I'm obsessed with, with um, consumer as well as, as designing for a consumer. So when I worked on, on shower gel and, and on deodorant, I would spend hours, I would bring samples at home, I would sit with my friends and I, we would smell and we would test and I would shower 16 times a day. You can argue whether that's healthy or not. But it's really, I really step into because it, it, it's exciting, but it's, I think that's part of being a marketeer as well. I don't know if I could personally be excited about napkins, but I, in the, the few roles that I've done and whether it's hair care or shower care or, or um, deodorants or now with air purifications, I found that I get extremely excited, but that's what make, helps me get informed. And then you start doing consumer visits and stuff and you become more empathetic and you, you relate to the product. And then the rest is history. Then the rest just follows because you start believing in it so much and talking about it, people around you feel it, and then it's reflected in the product and in the design that it brings. Now, I know I've said a lot of fluffy things and, and cute things and, and nice designs and stuff, but I know that who are all um, part of 
companies and we all I'm assuming do not work in NGOs that I don't work I, I don't work in community service but I think one thing when you work in big companies or small companies or startups or you obviously selling and is the end goal of it like yes you want to change the world and you want to change consumer behavior and you want to change how people look at your product or feel about your product but I guess if you don't sell then there's no point of me being here or you being here or us having this conversation at all so that's why the last segment of my presentation is really focusing about design with purpose cells I guess the first few examples that I gave you were more dreamy more beautiful more emotional in this segment I focus more on things that uh, that are purposeful but I can guarantee you are billion dollar brands and and I've made it and are just good examples of why design with purpose should be and is the future so these are some of everyday women winners so I'm hoping a lot of you are familiar with Bumble which was which IPO'd, of course, as well, which is a dating app and is a social network by women for everybody. And it changed basically the dating industry in the sense that it, it allows only the woman to, to start the conversation, empowering the women, women in a very small feature that differentiated them and made them different than Tinder and Hinge and the billions of dating apps that exist out there. I'm sure a lot of us have tried them. And Bumble sort of gave a place of safety, a place of empowerment for women, which I think worked really well for them. Another um, app, and we'll get to products as well, because I don't think this only is designed through apps, is Calm, which is um, also an equivalent of Headspace. And I think these two apps sort of brought... Basically, they democratized mindfulness, which I think is very cool. And, and for me, it's shocking that it hasn't happened in our parents' age or our grandparents' age. But it makes so much sense that it is now so democratized. And with the press of a button, you can solve or try to solve or, or for some um, mindfulness needs and well-being needs. And through simple things, right? Through making sleep cool through making therapy sexy through through really like taking the simple things of life and making them accessible and not hiding behind them one of also my favorite examples and and i'm not sure i don't know how much it grew outside of the us but this is a brand that i i remember when it launched which was i guess 10 years ago and it's called Thinks, and it's evolved a lot in, in its campaigns, and it's very fascinating when you look at those brands and their history. Of course, before, it used to be to speak only about women and their periods, and now it's more gender exclusive and uh, inclusive, sorry, and basically it's patriarchy-proof underwear. But basically what this company did, and this is a very example of a product designed with purpose, right? Because you had underwear all around and, and underwear has existed before any of us did. But I realized that women get their periods and it's not a very pleasant thing and it's not even a pleasant thing to talk about. But they created basically period-proof underwear for women to stop. And if there's women on the call, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Stop worrying whether they've like ruin their pants or whether they're like they need to go to the bathroom a hundred times a day and stuff like that and I think this really is a great example of bringing purpose into design and basically building on a very visible need another example but this is I guess some I think most of those are product driven this is more of a campaign driven and I think it did lead into into product and it did lead into them obviously asics growing in sales and whatnot but this um this camp this 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 campaign and this brand really spoke to me and i saw this maybe a year ago and it was one of the first examples that came to my mind when i was putting this presentation and it's 
not all transformations are visible, right? I mean, a lot of us work out a lot and we don't have those six packs and those like sleek arms, but we do work out because it's good for our mind and it's good for our health. And it doesn't mean that if you're not super skinny, you're not transforming. And the last one, which I think is very close to my heart and and I hope a lot of people's hearts as well and is the last brand that I worked on before I moved into this role is Dove. And I think when you think about beauty with purpose, Usually Dove is one of the first brands that comes to mind and, and there's tons of campaigns. And of course, they've tested with things that have worked and things that haven't worked. But basically, they've spoken about things that people never wanted to speak about, like curves and bodies that people didn't want to see and, and a diversity that people were not comfortable speaking about or showing or talking about or whatnot. And I think... For me, what's fascinating about a multi-billion dollar brand like Dove is that at the end of the day, they sell very basic products. It's a deodorant, it's a shower gel, it's a shampoo. So you could really think that at some point, those were probably like napkins as well. Um, but what is beautiful and what I always tell my team is that it's up to those brands to speak and make impact through purposeful design because they have the share of shelves, they have the share of consumers, you're selling billions of products a year. So you really own a space in retail, you own a space online, you own a space in people's houses, you own a space in, in at the gyms, you own a space, you own a space everywhere. So what can your pack say? What can your design say? What can your logo speak about? What can your, and that's, all through the, obviously, the simple product that you sell. And, and, and there's a lot of purpose and beauty that can come into that. So I think if I, if I try to summarize from the examples that I, that I brought and, and from the learnings on the right questions to ask and, and what I really think is the way to go forward is basically designing with purpose is fun. Like really, it you put yourself in consumers' needs, in consumers' shoes, you understand really what is it that they're after. And there's tons of ways to play around it. And think of the instructor manual where you building a bed becomes a, a comic book with characters and, and relatability and stuff like that. Design with purpose is beautiful. It's really like, if you think about um, the Before I Die project and you turn murals like in communities and you link communities all over the world together through wishes and dreams and through making something. Yes, you're not selling something in that case. Probably you're selling happiness to a certain extent but or selling a sense of belonging but it is beautiful in the sense that it brings people together through whatever product or or wall or community you design and the third thing is um that of course design with purpose sells and there's ton of examples and i think um i can share much much more but obviously i don't have all the time in the world only have me for 45 minutes but I think design with purpose has proven to sell. So I think there's no reason anymore for us to just design for the sake of designing and for us to have a product for the sake of having product, because there are tons of brands who have made it through solely designing from purpose. But again, I don't think, again, there's tons of examples of brands that have just relied on purpose without having a real need in mind. And I think that that is not the way to go about it and I think that that has failed in many cases but once you link purpose beauty and a need all into design then you can definitely guarantee it will sell so and in summary and I know it's a bit of a bold statement that I will leave you with but in design with purpose should be the only type of design in 2023 onwards because purpose is no longer a fluffy word that just floats around purpose is really all around us and Purpose is really what 
drives design and beauty these days. Um, and I, with this slide, I, I, I wrap up and of course we'll open the, the floor for any questions or comments or um, I don't know, thoughts you wanna give or things you wanna argue or, but I, I've spent a lot of time thinking through design and, and experimenting with it. And again, if you think about it, just always think about the space you occupy in people's houses or on the streets or in the supermarket or on TV or, or on apps and think how much impact you can make through simple design changes that would impact people's lives. That's it. Great, thank you so much, Laura. That was so interesting. Um, I love the examples that you shared. I think they're ones that I haven't seen before. I mean, I've seen more of the kind of wellness apps like the, the Calm and the Bumble and those ones. Um, however, I love the, the Light Phone, the Man Journal, you know, all of, all of those. And I think, you know, one of the key things, and actually you touched on it later, is that actually by doing this, making them more inclusive actually kind of opens up the acceptance um, for these different kind of, purposes or different needs that people have. Um, I have a quick question um, just in terms of have you have, have you come across a particular design that has kind of really improved or really um, inspired you in your life? It's a very good question actually. <laughs> um, can I think through it but have you thought of your example first? <laughs> oh. I think through it. Need to think of mine as well. I mean, I and again, I think I'm biased because I've worked in in the FMCG world for a very long time. But I think when the foaming shower gel, which is the shower gel that you just press and it foams, yeah, really, I mean, changed my life is a bit dramatic, but <laughs> it it really impacted my experience in showering better because, like, you shave in the shower and you shower, and how can you combine that experience to make it simpler? And that's one example that I feel has worked. A simple design thought has of a product has has impacted me. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you've thought of your example, but I can probably think of a few more as well. well <laughs> I have, however, you know, I think one of the the things that I've come across, I'm sure you you obviously know as well, is that you know a lot of these designs, more in terms of the more kind of tactile or functional designs you know a lot of the time that they're obviously a lot better for people generally so they might be designed for people with disabilities um however they are actually kind of make it easier for people without disabilities to use as well and I think um especially things like what you just mentioned when you kind of get two in one in that sense like that's really helpful for people all around isn't it um, 100 and I think sorry to build on that I think when you speak about disabilities, it's crazy to think how many products are not thought of when it comes to yeah. different types of people. And when I was working in the deodorants category, there was a project that was kicked off that now I think should be in stores already, which is you never think about somebody who doesn't have limbs, how they use deodorant, right? Because they can't spray. They And Rixona created this whole campaign around it and 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 it makes you cry if you watch it but for me what's insane it took us till 2021 to think about design de designing for this yeah. and it's crazy so if you take all of those simple things that are around us and you see how you can improve it I think disability is also and in I, I didn't focus much on it in in this session but there's definitely like a lack and a beauty in designing for disability because you 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 don't see it represented neither in our communities nor in our products from the yeah. simple things if you can't see if you're blind or you can't open things and what are the different ways to to basically bring that to life and I think as well you know when you're talking about design with purpose you know you you were kind of saying uh you've got the beauty side and then you've got the purpose side and beauty is obviously more aesthetic and for people you know who have blindness how are they then going to connect and find something beautiful and desirable if they can't see those elements that you might have put into the design exactly exactly and that's why why brands need to start experimenting with different types of things with different senses right like 
the t- the touch or or the sound or that you can but that's another level an extra level of thinking of something because usually you just have a pretty pack and uh, you think everybody can see it but it's not yeah. and the simple things also colorblind people like like also they're not thought of and I've spent some time recently reading some articles about that and people don't take them into consideration a lot because they can see but actually they can't see a lot of the beauty around us so how can you accelerate beauty for people like this and I've even seen actually recently as well you know there, there are different font types for people even with ADHD you know that kind of yeah. help read better and quicker and it's just there are so many different it's great that actually we're seeing more and more of these things becoming more and more popular and kind of being more developed as well I think definitely definitely agree um one of the questions that we have was um you were talking about becoming an expert in kind of understanding the consumers and I guess um because I know you recently kind of change your roles and um, what's the kind of key difference for you in terms of designing with purpose and understanding that your consumer base from the more kind of dove beauty elements some of the examples that you showed to working more with blue air and the air purifiers I think it's a it's a very good question and I think I, I like ask myself this not ask I, I live through this every day I think it's been a month since I started this job and when you work with fast moving consumer goods like Dove and Axe, when you design things so fast and so much, it's very easy to be fast in getting an insight and reaching people's home. And your price point is so low. You're talking like seven pounds, eight pounds, three pounds. And, and you're really, you can very fast enter into consumer's house and be on retail shelves, right? And as a marketeer and a product innovator, you get to design that from, from the start because I can I used to choose fragrances. I used to create designs. Like we created the pride design for Axe and that was so beautiful for a brand like Axe that started with, with a very different past and became advocating for pride. And, and I was so happy when we created that design. It happened fast and it entered people's houses. Now, when, as I shift to Blue Air, um, you're creating $300 machines, basically, and devices that are big, that are bulky, that reach a certain um, LSM and consumer. So it's a completely different consumer. It's much more product and tech heavy that uh, as a marketeer, I don't really influence the, the actual product. I give in, in, impact, uh, input on design and, and user friendliness but I don't really influence the technology because it's very complex and it's designed in Sweden in a lab with like all these engineers and stuff. So that has had me to shift and it's not as easy to test and see the difference, right? Like a deodorant, you try on one arm, one deodorant, on another arm, the one deodorant for a week and you make your whole group of friends try it and it's so easy to understand the consumer. With an air purifier or, or like things that are bigger and more expensive, you have to take a different approach to understanding the consumer. You need to be patient. You need to spend time. You need to target people who have allergies. And my sister had a lot of allergies. So now I've sent one to her house and I'm like, I need you to track how you're feeling every day. And she's like, you're crazy. I'm like, I get it. But um, <laughs> it's much more difficult. Aside the point, sister. <laughs> and, and it's, and it's, yeah, it's, and it's, and it's a very good question because with different products and different industries, you really need to approach the consumer from a different point of view. And now I spend much more time online to understand what are the things that people talk about. And then I have literally three purifiers in a very small New York apartment, which I think is an oversaturation of purifiers. But, and I experiment with things like I light the candle and I see how it it goes crazy and stuff like that. So yeah, it's different when you have less control of the product, it becomes a bit more difficult to design but then you need to be more creative in, in the messaging and how you communicate to that consumer about what this really brings to them. Great. Well, I think we've actually hit our time now, Lara. Um, so thank you very much. Um, just say our next session will be at half past two with Johanna, who is managing partner at Pond Design Sweden. Um, she'll be discussing how design can be used as a positive driver in chaotic times. Laura, thank you so much. Uh, We'll speak to you soon. That's one. Bye.